Welcome. Today we want to talk about what is ultrasound and how does it work. If you've ever wondered how that music gets from the speaker to your ear, it's by sound waves. By creating vibrations in the air, it transmits that energy over a great distance. It's also no surprise that moving air can carry a great deal of power and energy. In physical therapy, we harness the power of moving air through the technology called ultrasound. Before we can jump into how ultrasound works, we need to review a little bit about waves. A wave is defined as a repeating pattern that moves energy from one place to another, either through space or through matter. Waves come in two different types, a longitudinal wave or a transverse wave. There are some characteristics that are common to both types of waves. Those include things such as frequency, wavelength, and amplitude. Let's take a quick look at how longitudinal and transverse waves are different. In a longitudinal wave, the particles of the medium move parallel to the direction the wave is transmitting energy. This leads to alternate areas where the material is compressed and where it's rarefacted or spread out. In a transverse wave, the particles move perpendicular to the direction that the energy is being transferred. This leads to alternating areas of peaks and valleys. There's some terminology used to describe waves that will be helpful in understanding ultrasound. In a wave, we refer to one cycle as the distance from one point on a wave to that same point again. When discussing waves, we often discuss the term frequency. Frequency is defined as the number of cycles that occur within one second. The unit used to represent frequency is the hertz. One hertz equals one cycle per second. So for the right side of the graph, we have two cycles occurring in one second, so our frequency would be two hertz. Waves are also referred to by their amplitude and their wavelength. Amplitude can be defined as the maximum displacement of a particle from its position of equilibrium. In general, amplitude refers to the amount of energy a wave is carrying. Finally, we have wavelength. Wavelength is the measure of distance from one point on a wave cycle to the same point on the next wave cycle. The typical unit for wavelength is meters. Now let's return to the concept of ultrasound. The definition is easy if we break the word down. Ultra typically means beyond, while sound is a longitudinal wave that carries energy. So in this case, ultrasound refers to sound waves that are beyond our range for hearing. In PT, we create ultrasonic waves using an ultrasound unit. The ultrasound unit consists of a control unit and a transducer. The control unit determines the amount of energy that's sent to the transducer. The transducer converts electrical energy into sound waves. The sound wave is created by a vibrating crystal inside the transducer. It's important to note it's the crystal inside the transducer head that determines the effective area producing energy. We refer to this area as the effective radiating area or ERA of the crystal. The expansion and contraction of the crystal creates a longitudinal wave that travels out from the transducer head. It's the area created by this longitudinal wave that affects tissues in the human body. Here you can see alternating areas of compression and rarefaction of our sound wave. Most ultrasounds create sound waves in the megahertz range, or a million cycles per second. When we apply that ultrasound to the human tissue, we get a vibration of molecules inside. Ultrasound is capable of penetrating up to 5 centimeters inside the human body. So what happens when that energy reaches human tissue? While all the effects of ultrasound are not completely understood, current theory suggests that ultrasound achieves its physiologic effects through cavitation and acoustic streaming. Cavitation refers to the formation of small bubbles that result from the rapid pressure changes created by the ultrasound wave. The ultrasound waves also cause other molecules to vibrate. As a result, microcurrents are created in the fluids that surround the vibrating tissues. We refer to these small currents as acoustic streaming. Here's an example of cavitation. As energy is transferred to the patient, small gas bubbles form and vibrate, affecting the surrounding tissues. If too much energy is applied, those gas bubbles can become violent and burst. This is what we call unstable cavitation. The bursting of those bubbles can cause tissue damage. Here we have an example of acoustic streaming surrounding one of the vibrating gas bubbles. Again, the small currents that are created have an effect on the surrounding tissues. Cavitation and acoustic streaming result in the non-thermal effects of ultrasound. 
Ultrasound also has thermal effects. Use of higher ultrasound energies can result in the transfer of thermal energy from the ultrasound head to the patient. This transfer of heat can provide therapeutic benefits as well. Unfortunately, the transmission of ultrasound energy from the sound head to the patient is not a very efficient process. Therefore, we try and improve the efficiency of the process by use of a conducting medium. The ones used most often include ultrasound lotion or gel, water, or the use of a gel pad. So what's the result of transferring all that energy to our patients? With non-thermal ultrasound, we get an increase in many of the cellular processes needed for tissue to be able to heal. With the use of thermal ultrasound, we get the additional effects of increased blood flow, reduction in pain, and increased tissue extensibility. To make the best clinical decisions, it's important to understand that the ultrasound waves do not affect every type of tissue equally. Tissues with higher collagen content absorb the ultrasound energy more efficiently. Therefore, tissues that receive the most benefit include ligaments, tendons, and other connective tissues such as joint capsules. Now let's take a look at the different ultrasound parameters that need to be determined before treatment. The control unit of the ultrasound allows us to modify a variety of different parameters. Which parameters are chosen are determined by the size and depth of the target tissue and your clinical goals for the use of ultrasound. Our clinical goals are often dictated by which stage of the healing process the patient is in. Let's take a closer look at our different parameters and discuss how they affect our ultrasound treatment and clinical goals. The parameters we have control over include frequency, duty cycle, intensity, duration of the treatment, and the size of our treatment area. Let's look at these one at a time. First up is frequency. Most ultrasound units have the ability to switch between two different frequencies, usually around 1 MHz and 3 MHz. When deciding which to use, you should consider the depth of the target tissue. 1 MHz ultrasound has the ability to penetrate deeper, up to 5 cm. Ultrasound waves at 3 MHz will not penetrate as deep, only up to 1 to 2 cm. So if you're trying to target deeper tissues, you would want to use 1 MHz ultrasound. If your tissue is more shallow, you can use 3 MHz as your ultrasound frequency. Our next parameter is duty cycle. Duty cycle is defined as the percentage of time that the ultrasound transducer is emitting energy. The duty cycle can range from 100% or a continuous ultrasound where it is always on to 0% where ultrasound is off. Most units will have a few presets you can adjust. Using a lower duty cycle setting is a way to decrease the amount of energy being transmitted to the patient. As a general rule, continuous duty cycles or 100% are used for thermal ultrasound. Settings below that are used for non-thermal. The intensity determines the amplitude of the ultrasound wave or the amount of energy being transferred to your patient. Choosing an ultrasound intensity is usually determined by the clinical goals for the ultrasound and the patient's stage of healing. To take advantage of the non-thermal effects of ultrasound, a lower intensity should be used. If the thermal effects of ultrasound are desired, then a higher intensity should be used. It's important to point out that at higher levels of intensity, there is an increased risk for tissue damage. It's common to change the intensity during treatment to ensure that the desired effect is being achieved. The duration refers to the length of the ultrasound treatment. Treatment duration is most directly affected by the size of the treatment area and the amount of energy you want delivered to your patient. As a general guideline, in five minutes of duration, you can treat an area twice the size of the effective radiating area of the transducer head. So if the ERA is 10 centimeters squared, you can treat an area that's 20 centimeters squared over a five minute treatment period. A typical time for ultrasound treatment runs between five and 10 minutes with larger areas getting longer treatment times. The last parameter we want to consider is the size of the treatment area. Typically, the size of the treatment area is determined by the type of tissue involved and the condition being treated. While the size of the treatment area may be predetermined, it's an important factor when determining the other ultrasound parameters to be chosen. It's important when performing ultrasound to keep the size of the treatment area manageable. If ultrasound is performed over too large an area, then the tissue within that treatment area doesn't get enough ultrasound energy to benefit therapeutically. As we just discussed, you can treat an area about twice the size of the ERA in a five minute period. So if treatment time is increased to 10 minutes, you can treat an area roughly four times the size of the ERA. Treating areas larger than four times the ERA should be avoided. 
so it's important to consider the size of the treatment area when determining the other ultrasound parameters. So when would we choose to use ultrasound in physical therapy? We use ultrasound to achieve one of the following clinical effects. Thermal ultrasound can be used to increase tissue extensibility. For connective tissue that is adaptively shortened, this can be very beneficial. Ultrasound can also be used to help treat pain. This can be done by either directly affecting the tissue causing the pain or by altering its transmission. Ultrasound is also commonly used to help improve tissue healing. For the acute stages of injury, only non-thermal ultrasound should be used to facilitate tissue healing. For more chronic injuries, both thermal and non-thermal ultrasound can be used. Finally, ultrasound can be used through a process called phonophoresis to help deliver topical compounds into the skin. It is believed that ultrasound changes the permeability of the skin, which helps deliver the compound to the tissues beneath it. Knowing when not to do ultrasound is just as important as knowing when it's beneficial. The contraindications or reasons to not do ultrasound are listed here. While there is a general consensus for most contraindications for ultrasound, there will be slight deviations based on your reference resource. Before considering doing ultrasound, it's important that the patient has been screened to ensure they don't have any contraindications for treatment. The clinician should also consider the precautions for the use of ultrasound listed here when determining if ultrasound will be completed. If after reviewing the precautions you can't be 100% sure the patient will be safe, then ultrasound should not be performed. Hopefully you have a better understanding now of what ultrasound is, how we create it, and how it's used clinically. For more guidance on how to properly apply ultrasound and choose the correct parameters, you can refer to our other videos that cover those specific topics.